Amazing! Woo! I can wait all day to say this. Please welcome Andrew Garfield. Woo! Ah, hi. I was just going to go there. Hey, guys. How you guys doing? Woo! Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've been waiting to have this conversation since I saw the film in Toronto at the world premiere at the Princess of Wales Theatre. So, I, I, first question is, like, why was this the right movie for you at the right time? How did this come about? Yeah, uh, midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of questioning the meaning of life and thinking about, sorry, I just ate some delicious sushi from the Blue Ruin Sushi around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> literally is digesting right now. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about death. <laughs> I was thinking about life. And I was thinking about the outrageousness that, that we're all gonna die. Like, it's what a weird fucking thing that we have to deal with. And, what? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Yeah, it's and um, and then and and what's maybe weirder is that we don't talk about it very much, and we don't consider it very much, and actually when it, we are faced with it suddenly, if it's with a loved one or a friend or a parent or anything, it's suddenly a huge difficult reckoning because there's been no education around it previously. So I was thinking about all of that. And I was, in the wake of my mother's passing, I was thinking about what I wanted to do with the next 40 years of my life, if I'm, you know, lucky enough to live that long. And I read the script, and it felt like the inside of my brain and my heart in that time. It felt like I, it, this is exactly all the questions that I was asking, and what a beautiful opportunity to, to attempt to try and bring all of that all of that questioning, all of that heartache, all of that longing, all of that love, all of that hope to a piece of a piece of art. Uh, nothing can prepare you for a, a death, even what you are trying to prepare yourself for. It. Yeah. Uh, but this movie also represents a true full circle moment from your very first movie, Boye. I uh, working with John Crown again. Uh, what was that like for you? Especially because obviously. You've done a whole lot of great stuff between 2007 and now, 2024. One person saw Boyer. <laughs> <laughs> Two people. <laughs> Two people. Uh, that's plenty. That's actually a good percentage. <laughs> expected. Thank you. And if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. It's a really beautiful film. I don't know where you can get it, but I'm sure it's somewhere. Online. Online, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's out there. Peacock, baby! Who's got Peacock? Who's got Peacock? Who's got Peacock? Alright! Okay, I don't have Peacock. I guess I'm gonna get Peacock tonight. Um, check out Boye. It's, it's, um, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting subject matter. Again, it's a film with a lot of heart, and it's a film about finding heart in, in places that people deem unlovable. And it's a really kind of beautiful study of a, 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 a person that is. Um, deemed unlovable, but actually, um, yeah. Anyway, I won't say any more, but, uh, yeah, so John made Brooklyn as well, really, really beautiful, sensitive film, um, and yeah, it was wonderful. We've been wanting to work together again since Boyer, and um, and yeah, when the, we, 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 we tried um, a few times, and it just never felt quite right with the right script. Um, but yeah, I was so happy to, to be reunited with him here. You know, when I was, when I, I knew what the film was going to be about, and, and I, what it really struck me when I saw the movie for the first time was, you know, this chemistry with you and Florence Pugh is just absolutely magnificent. Isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? It's Woo! Woo! Um, when you the first time you met Florence, like, what you talk about to, like, help further define your individual roles, but also the bond between you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, she's phenomenal, obviously, and... I, uh, I saw her first work working in Lady Macbeth, and then I saw Midsommar, of course, and um, a 
few other famous women. And um, she's just one of those very rare actors that you just want to watch forever. Like she'll have a long, illustrious career, and it's gonna just get better and better. She just has this gift, this crazy, crazy gift. Um, so when we first met, we were both kind of cagey. <laughs> like we were both, you know excited, nervous, like kind of dogs sniffing each other, I guess. Just kind of like, who's going to be the dominant, who's going to be the submissive? And are we both dominant? Are we both? Like, what is it? And, and, and do, do we like each other, really? And can we play well together? And can we play safely? And can we go to dangerous places safely? Because obviously there's a lot of dangerous places we have to go to physically, emotionally um, vulnerable spots you know that I, I the fact that she we got to the point where we both felt comfortable with each other enough where I could have my face and in pretty much in her butt um, <laughs> but, and, and that it, it, it was completely natural uh, it, it is a testament to you know her and her courage as a, as a person as an actor but also I think um, to the bond that we created as, as friends and as, as colleagues. And um, yeah, she's just an incredibly courageous, talented, sensitive, caring, attentive person and actor. Uh, there's, there's, another, there's another element to that bond, and that's the actress who plays your daughter in the film. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, very, playing a father, a very different from Magnum and Holmes. Oh, yeah. Very, very different movie. Yeah. 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 But uh, you know, how did that this sort of like bring you all together closer and again just make you real I mean that the, the family feeling that the three of you have is just so important to have again. Shane. Thanks for thank you. Yeah. So yeah, uh, she's a, a beautiful little actress called Grace. She's a beautiful little girl that we didn't realize we were filming most of the time. Which is, which is the best because the last thing you want is like remember the closing credits of Little Rascals when all the young actors are like, looking down the lens of the camera and it's like, Can you not look down the lens of the camera, please? Like she never did any of that. She was just there to hang with us. I think she called she called us. Um, Mummy Florence and Daddy Andrew. Uh, it was, yeah, it was very, very sweet. And um, and her mom was so lovely. I think that's really important that we got really close with with her mom as well. So she felt safe because she saw us interacting. It was all just yeah. It was a very lovely family feeling. And especially I think in scenes like in the in the in the head shaving scene, like giving her so much to do, so much to occupy herself with, and making her a part, like a fully improvised twenty minute scene where I shaved Paul Flores' head. So, so that was, I was going to ask you about that scene, so you kind of kind of improvised it and you only really could do one take yeah, for that. Yeah, we couldn't glue it back on. They, uh, <laughs> they, uh, and Stuart, our camera operator and DP, was terrified of some camera fault that could have happened, but yeah, because we only had one shot of it and yeah, Flores was brave enough and kind of passionate enough where she really wanted to do it, so yeah, yeah it was a beautiful, a beautiful scene to shoot, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it, there's not just the trust that you and Florence have to have in each other, there's also the trust that you have to absolutely, in a case like this, have to have with your director. So so how did your trust in John really help help scenes like, you know, the head shaving scene? Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of scenes where you had to really feel safe, like yeah. you pointed out. Yeah. How did John do that? But being a great actor's director. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the director is like, the dad or the mum on set, or both. Um, and in John's case, more, more motherly than fatherly in some kind of, I don't know, stereotypical way. He was much more, um, he was incredibly sensitive and caring. And I think the job is to kind of create a container and to set up an environment where um, there is no uh, failure, actually. Like, that, 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 that your kids can kind of do no wrong. You set the parameters and you let them play. You say, this is the frame and I want to see your soul, and, and please, I, I promise you I will take care of your soul, I won't, I won't misuse it, I won't extort it, I won't exploit it, I will honor it, and as, as long as it's in service of, of this story and these characters, then I promise you, you're, you're safe to, to give everything, I'm only gonna use the best bits. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite scenes, uh, and it's a scene that's very, very serious, but with some levity there, is like I want kids. Oh, I don't. I don't want them. And, you know, he's not yet. Uh, I just love. I just love the way that scene played out. And, and there's there's quite a few scenes where it's just a two hander between you and Florence. Yeah. So so you know, it's John the kind of director where 
you try like a lot of takes or is it like let's try to get in as few takes as possible and 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 how did that how did that work especially on the real dialogue heavy scenes yeah yeah he's not we we didn't have time to go all that but you know it was a, a shortish shoot it's an independent film and uh so we didn't get we maybe do three at, at best kind of thing three or four and if we were really really weren't getting it, we would carry on. But that didn't really happen very often. It was a kind of, from the get-go, Florence and I kind of locked in, and we, we both realized that every take can and should and will be different, um, and alive, and spontaneous. Even though the script is the script, and we really kind of stuck to it, um, the, uh, there's a liveness within it that um, kind of allowed us to, to play. And yeah, John, yeah, he really, yeah, I don't know. They, it, we, we didn't do a great deal of takes. And, you know, John would always say in Boy, in, on Boy A, because I was so young, I was so insecure, I would always say, no, no, I need to do one more, I need to do one more, I need to do one more, I'm so sorry, I need to do one more, because I'm, I'm terrible, I need to be better. And he would always say, Andrew, I promise you it's fine. And I would say, no, I promise you it's not. And he, he admitted later, he was like, you know what, every time you ask for an extra take, that's the take I use. So there's something that I had some weird, like, youthful instinct that I was in fact bad and I needed to offer something better. <laughs> you know, I, I really couldn't wait to ask you this question. You know, when you're, you're prepping for a role, you're practicing your performance, you know, maybe you're doing rehearsal and, and you're, you're really have an approach to how you're going to deliver your performance, but before you get to that, you have to remember your lines. So, what is your process <laughs> to remember your lines? Because everybody's different. Uh, so funny. Um, it's something I don't really think about. It's in theater, of course, it's different. But with the film, and I always panic the night before because I usually don't know my lines the night before. <laughs> because I just think I have this endless amount of time and I want it to be alive. I don't want to get too hung up on. I, I, I don't tend to. There's no practicing in that way for me. It's. You kind of learn them neutrally. You learn the thoughts and you learn how they connect. But you, you're not putting any kind of intention on them. You're not putting any kind of choice on them yet. Um, you're just kind of building your own inner life up so that the lines are there when you need them in the moment. But uh, but until then, they are this kind of, these kind of neutral things. And uh, it keeps me spontaneous. Uh, of course, I have to know the lines, but, uh, but I don't. I don't want to know how I'm gonna, how they're gonna be delivered, or maybe even sometimes in what order they're gonna be delivered. Like to stay. Uh, I guess that's the old oh, story. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, I like to keep things very alive and spontaneous, and the tendency is a kind of maybe when I started acting, it was more I've got to be good, I've got to be good, I've got to get it right, I've got to get it right. I would have a preordained idea of how I was going to play a scene or how a line could sound or feel. Um, but that, it was Ryan Gosling was the first person. I did a screen test with Ryan Gosling about 20 years ago now uh, for a, a film version of The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, the Michael Shabon book that never got made. Yeah, that Stephen Daldry was going to direct. Um, and it never got made because it was too expensive. And, and But I remember. I didn't know who Ryan was. I was a, 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 a theater actor in England, in London at the time. And this guy showed up and he was like Marlon Brando or something. He was just kind of roaming the set as if it was his set. And I was like, is he allowed to do this? <laughs> and, and the way he was behaving was just this inspiring, kind of wild, free, spontaneous, alive creature. And every take, every time the camera would roll, he would he would not know where the scene was going. And, and I had to just kind of follow and catch up and be there. It woke me up, it woke my instrument up because he was, he was so alive. So I think since then I was like, ah, that's where I wanna, I wanna live. That book, uh, the, the Amazing Adventures of Cavalier Clay, won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, I always wonder why they never made it. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> that is, Incredible story. Um, but uh, so when I was watching the film, you're all watching it tonight. So you know we see movies and TV shows that have you know a birth scene and some really really stand out. This stands out. <laughs> Why does this stand out? In fact, the, the, the Toronto premiere people applauded <laughs> the scene. Um, so how did you prep for that scene? How did you film it? How many takes did you have yeah. to do? 
Yeah, so that, when I read that scene in the script, I did think, oh, I've never seen anything like this before on, on screen. I have never seen a birth scene like this. And that was the, the scene that made me go, I have to do this, I, have to be a, I don't know how this is gonna work, but I have to be a part of it. And then we got to rehearsals, and it's the only scene we really rehearsed properly over and over and over again because of the physicality of it, obviously. And they, they created in our rehearsal room the size of the, um, the bathroom in, out of that tape on the floor. And it was like, how are two people, and alone four people gonna actually, and then another person gonna come into that, like a baby, how is that gonna happen? Um, and, and we worked with the two wonderful actors in that scene in the, in the petrol, in the gas station. And uh, yeah, we kind of physically blocked it out, and like kind of beat by beat. But again, we wanted to keep it alive because it was so chaotic. We wanted to keep that chaos, and we had the the you know, the, the 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 actress playing the EMT on the phone on live during the thing. And the first take, we would get you know building up, building up, building, up, getting ready to go. And like halfway through the first take, the phone, the prop phone that I was using that was that had the the person on the other end of the line suddenly dropped, the call dropped, and went, doo, 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 you are out of credit. And I almost <laughs> killed the prop person. I almost strangled them. Because like, Florence is all fours completely naked, and I'm like, this is inappropriate to be first strangled. Like, this guy, we can't do this. But anyway, it, that was all fine. People got bollocking, and we carried on. We went back to the take two. And I think we did it, I don't know, maybe eight or nine times. And it was like, a, you know, it, this has been edited down, so it was like, a, 10, 15 minute scene, um, but powerful. Every time, very, very powerful and uh, yeah, very alive. And it was weird, like in that toilet, it felt like we had created some weird, holy, sacred space by the end of that scene because, you know, obviously we're just actors or whatever. My brother is an actual doctor who actually delivers babies, but I pretended to, and that's also cool. Um, but, but like, there was something so powerful, and then in, we shot it over two days, and on the last day, we, we had the real baby there for the last um, kind of afternoon, and this is an 11-day-old newborn, and, you know, I'm sorry, but sh shitting and, and pissing whenever <laughs> she wanted, uh, all over our hands and all over, and it was just the most beautiful, strange experience, <laughs> and overwhelming in terms of the responsibility to be holding this newborn baby and passing it with one arm between Forrest's legs and she grabbed it with one arm between her and then yeah and it felt like we had created like a, a little mini chapel out of that toilet by the end of it. That's, that's a hell of a couple days you got there. Uh, so because the movie is, is uh, was edited and put together at the time you're jumping back and forth you know what was it like for you the first time you saw the movie when it was completely finished? Yeah I, I saw about three or four different uh, iterations of it. Um, I, 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 I kind of, you know, when I signed up, I said to John, like, I want to be a part of the whole process of this with you and be a real collaborator. And he was really open to that. He really wanted that. So I offered a, a bunch of thoughts and uh, ideas in, in in certain stages of the edit. And yeah, it changed a lot. It changed a lot. There, there are, there are like, it's so funny. It's, it's so interesting. It's so hard being a director, I think, because you. As they say, you have to kill your darlings over and over and over again. There are so many scenes that John really wanted to be in the film, that I really wanted to be in the film, that didn't make the cut, and that um, like really profound, crazy. I'll just tell you one really, really quick, beautiful scene that's not in the film that I, that, um, and that again was another reason why I wanted to do the film. It's just such a beautiful scene. So after, I don't know, maybe I should not. Um, <laughs> so after um, this ice skating and we come home and it's just me and my and our daughter and our new dog um, and we get the eggs and um, there's a scene where it's it's Tobias alone in um, uh, in the living room or in the, at the dining table and he's got um, all of Albert's old like library card, credit card, all of her old things and he's calling uh, all these different places and cancelling all of I know, it's like rude, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's a bit much. And it was like, so it, he's just in the middle of like, and it's like, in, like, like a series of quick cuts of dealing with like bureaucrats from like MasterCard and Visa, and then like, oh yeah, and then the, the Rotary Club, whatever it is. And he's like, and everyone's being very, very nice over the phone to him. And then at one point, one person is just so nice, he's just so tender to it. He's like, I'm so, so sorry for your loss. And he's like, oh, it's okay. And he, and, 
right in the middle of it, he just cracks and he like fully breaks down and like like a freight train hits him and he like tries to like stifle it and not let the person on the other end of the line know that he, that he's so upset and like sobbing like wrecked with sobs. And then eventually he kind of comes back to the phone and he's like, so sorry about that. In a very, very English kind of, kind of you know, stiff up a lip way. I'm like, I'm so, so sorry. So yeah, the, the number is 506, I remember. And it was just such a beautiful, beautifully written scene. But but John, I, and I think John was right, the most powerful, is, you don't need to say it. We can, we can fill those moments in, I think. And the ending is so simple and subtle and leaves, leaves us, the audience, to kind of imagine how life will and can continue for, for this family. So ladies and gentlemen, now that you've seen the film, so, so two things uh, that would, one that would really help us out is, uh, if you please stay seated while we exit, that would be very, very, very helpful. Second, most important, now that you've seen the film and this amazing crowd, how do you spread the word about the movie? Letterbox. Please? Letterbox. <laughs> So, you know, if you want to use Facebook, if you want to use Instagram and, you know, TikTok, you in the back, if you're still using X, knock yourself out. <laughs> Please spread the word about We Live in Time. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, and you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. And we will be a big as I do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye guys. Thank you. Have a great Go week. Dodgers, baby. Go Dodgers. Go Dodgers.